Well, good evening, everyone. Absolutely. For those that have not had the chance to meet, my name's John Hybushin. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Reagan Foundation, and I just want to thank all of you for coming out here this evening. In honor of our men and women who protect our freedoms around the world, if you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please take a seat. Before we get started this evening, there is a particular person in the audience I'd like to make sure we recognize. That would be the son of President Ronald Reagan, Michael Reagan. Michael. Well, first, let me say that it is a real honor to welcome Grover back to the Reagan Library. Grover is, hands down, one of the brightest and most articulate public policy experts in this country. And to have him here promoting his, what is now his fourth book, makes this a special occasion. I hope that each of you have got a little bit of time in your hands to stay afterward, after his remarks, to get a copy of his signed book. It'll take place right up here in the front. For those of you who have never had the chance to visit Grover's offices in Washington, D.C., you may still have a good idea what his organization, Americans for Tax Reform, fights for every day. It's the very same thing that President Reagan fought for his entire life, and that is tax relief. In fact, as Grover can tell you, Americans for Tax Reform was launched by Grover at President Reagan's request in 1985. A year later, President Reagan went on to endorse Grover's now famous Taxpayer Protection Pledge, signed by literally thousands of office holders since that time it was first introduced. With his Taxpayer's Pledge and years of toiling in the trenches against increased taxes and wasteful government spending, it's a fact that Grover has saved everyone here a lot of money. There's probably no doubt that everyone in this audience is not happy with how much they have to pay in the way of taxes today. But there is a real certainty that without Grover's steadfast work over the years, everyone here would be paying even higher taxes today. Here at the Reagan Foundation and Library, we take a special interest in one part of Grover's agenda. It's called the Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan Legacy Project, which he started almost 20 years ago. Its mission is to get every governor of every state to declare February 6th Ronald Reagan's birthday as Ronald Reagan Day. They also work to encourage the naming of landmarks, highways, buildings, you name it, after President Reagan. According to Grover, they will not stop until all 3,140 counties in the United States honor President Reagan in some way. As I welcome Grover to the microphone, allow me to do so by quoting another close friend of the Reagan Library, and that is Speaker Newt Gingrich. Newt has said of Grover, and I quote, he is the person who I regard as the most innovative, creative, courageous, and entrepreneurial leaders of the anti-tax efforts and of conservative grassroots activism in America. He has truly made a difference and truly changed American history. Now, I could not have said it any better. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please welcome to the Reagan Library an American hero, Grover Norquist. Thank you, John, Michael. The, uh, in 1774, before we were a country, Americans, colonists, were paying between 1% and 2% of their income in taxes. 
the British in London were paying 20 percent. So our oppressors were paying 20 percent. We were paying one to two. Word came out that they were thinking of going to three. The guns came out. We had a revolution. Said we're out of here. Okay. <laughs> now, a country formed in tax revolt that almost cut in two a few years later with the Risky Rebellion, okay, because Congress put taxes on uh, whiskey, which really hurt guys west of the mountains, not so much the east. And all the predictions at the time were that the country would split in two over this issue, east-west, not north-south, east-west. Later, we almost split north-south in 1830 when South Carolina called out the militia over the excise tax, which hurt the South more than, than the North. So we have a country that's tax sensitive and a people tax sensitive. Okay? Somehow we went from one to two total taxes, federal, state, local, okay, uh, to 30% tax, federal, state, and local. What happened? And how do we fix it? And that's what the, the book is about. First part of the book's on how we got here, uh, and it starts with 17 lies the government tells us, or rather, friends of government. During the American Revolution, there were the patriots and the loyalists, also known as sons of liberty and friends of government. Okay? The friends of government, the people who, when it comes to a fight between taxpayers and the government, between you and the government, always side with the government. They've always been with us. It's just the first time out we shipped a bunch of them to Canada. So, patriots, loyalists, sons of liberty, friends of government. The friends of government have been arguing about um, why we should raise taxes each time. And I have 14 different uh, lines they give you. It's like the Saturday Night Live uh, land shark thing, right? The, the land shark's knocking on the doors, trying to get you to open the door so he can eat you. And, you know, they're pretty savvy apartment dwellers who, who don't fall for the first couple, but eventually they open the door, they get eaten. Um, one of them is, we're going to raise this tax because some other tax is so onerous. We'll loot, cut the other tax if we raise this or create some new tax. Uh, new Jersey is the poster child uh, on this one. In New Jersey, they had no sales tax or income tax in 1965. This is not back in you know, the 1800s. In 1965, no sales tax, no income tax. And they said, you know, our property taxes are so high. We need to have a sales tax so the property taxes can go down. And they sold it. And 11 years later, when they had high sales taxes and high property taxes, Governor Byrd said, you know, if we had an income tax, then that property tax would be lower. Uh, so today, New Jersey has the highest property taxes in the neighborhood, a sales tax, and high income taxes, all three. So if somebody says to you, you know, that nasty tapeworm you have, wouldn't be as big a problem if you were to swallow two smaller ones. <laughs> because the two smaller ones would convince the first tapeworm to get smaller. Tapeworms and taxes grow on their own accord. Uh, and if you create them, they will grow. So that, that's one. We cut, we'll raise this tax, the other go. Uh, then the whole series, my favorite, the sort of perfect tax increase was the tax increase on long-distance phone calls to pay for the Spanish-American War. Okay? <laughs> this was 1898. Tax lasted more than 100 years. But it had all the elements of a perfect new tax. It's an emergency, so don't think about it. Two, it's a war. Be patriotic. Three, it's temporary. The Spanish Empire is falling apart. This war isn't going to be around for very long. It's a tax on other people, the rich. A phone at that time cost $5,000 $5, in today's dollars. Not a lot of people had phones. And the people who had phones were not making a lot of long-distance phone calls. So the tax was on long-distance phone calls. It was a tax on the rich. It was tax on them. It was temporary. It was patriotic. It's an emergency. It won't be there forever. It lasted 100 years. Longest living veteran of the Spanish-American War was a tax. At some point, we figured out, I mean, I went to public school, but I saw on the History Channel that the war had been over for some time. 
and we saw, started a campaign to, to get rid of it. Um, and eventually, we did finish it off. But it, it really is a thing of beauty, and I think they're going to bury it at Arlington. Um, <laughs> then there was the Johnson Flood, Pennsylvania. Everybody remember the horrible Johnson, reading about the horrible Johnson Flood. Um, they passed a tax on liquor to pay to clean up the flooded area. The tax is not only still with us, it keeps increasing on a regular basis. But that was an emergency. Hey, hey, don't think about it. Emergency. Raise the tax. Stays forever. Temporary taxes tend to be permanent. They're all serious. Wars tend to be a real problem because war comes, people raise taxes, and the taxes stay long after the war is over. They put an income tax, north and south, for the Civil War. South's income tax ended at Appomattox. The North's income tax continued till 1871. Um, eventually, it did go away, but it gave people an appetite for how cool it was to have that tool. And War of 1812, they actually got rid of all the taxes. But they raised taxes to pay for war, comes back down again, but the government never quite gets back to the shape it was in before. So it ratchets, um, ratchets up. The argument in the book is that we can think about getting rid of the IRS. One of the reasons I think we need to is not only that I'd like to get back towards the one to two in terms of size of government, not necessarily at one to two, but in that direction as opposed to the other direction. Uh, and this is a real, I believe, a real option. But we saw the cost of having an IRS when the Obama administration reacted to the growth of the Tea Party movement. Okay? Tea Party movement was the first reaction to too much spending. And when you think about taxes, we always need to think about spending first. It's the spending that drives the need, the desire, the push for taxes. It, the other team doesn't want taxes. They want spending. They just have to have taxes to get to the spending. Um, and if you have the spending, it's like roadkill. The, the flies will show up. The taxes will show up. Um, but the spending out there first, taxes come. And the American, I would have told you after many years of working in the taxpayer movement that you had to wait until taxes were raised before the American people would pull out the pitchforks. Uh, proposition, a lot of spending increase in California. Property taxes were going up. Proposition 13 passed. In Massachusetts, Proposition 2.5. Income taxes were raised going up, and then Kemp Roth, the Reagan tax cut, passed. People reacted to the taxes, but they hadn't reacted to the spending that made the other inevitable. In 2009, just a couple months into the Obama administration, there was so much spending so quickly that a million people went out and demonstrated a 1,000 different rallies the week of April 15, 2009, Tea Party movement, focused on spending. Not taxes, spending. It scared the Obama administration terribly. And we know that the IRS decided to sit down and not allow all of these groups to incorporate as 501c4. So it would be easy to throw a few bucks together, get a, um, rent a room, hire one person, have a bank account, and feel everything was going to be OK. Um, and it stunted their growth. They got going, a lot of energy. There's a wonderful study by the American Enterprise Institute, two Harvard professors, one from Stockholm, one from AEI, put out a paper that I cite in the book that argues that, that you look at where they had Tea Party rallies and where they were going to, but it was rained out. So they had the same desire, but one had the rally. One actually had people physically show up and meet, get to know each other, swap business cards, Facebook each other, and one didn't. And they said from that, they noticed that the tea, where you had rallies, the Tea Party movement drove the Republican vote up in 2010, the uh, off-year House elections, by between 3.2 and 5.8 million voters. Okay? That's how big it was. What didn't happen in 2012? Romney got a million more votes <coughs> than uh, McCain did, a million more. You didn't keep the oomph going because they'd knocked the legs out from under uh, the Tea Party groups that existed and stuff. But they, I mean, Proposition 13 created the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Group, still going. CLT 
in Massachusetts, Citizens for Limitation, started in 78, still going. They incorporated, they got going. That's what didn't happen in many hundreds of cities and many of the states. I do believe that it is accurate to say that the IRS's decision to kneecap the growing Tea Party movement made it possible for Obama to win re-election. It was wise of the administration to do what they did. Not good, but wise. And when the IRS decides to become a player in elections, when Lois Lerner, who was in charge of harassing the Tea Party groups, gave a speech on my birthday in 2010, April 19, uh, October 19th, 2010, <clears throat> and said, they're telling me to do something. They're telling me to do something before the election. A speech in front of a group. It's taped. That's why we know what she said. People say, where's the email from the White House? You didn't need an email. You saw the President of the United States at the State of the Union address talking about getting other people's money out of politics and screaming at the Supreme Court. You saw Democrats sending letters to Lois Lerner, and you saw Lois Lerner say, they're all screaming at me to do something before the election. Now, in certain Latin American countries, if the army was talking about, they're telling me to do something before the election, you'd get nervous. Here it wasn't the army, it was the IRS. Um, so I do think that we may be beyond repair with this structure. Why was there not a single IRS agent, staffer, intern, who was a whistleblower? Okay, it's not only that it happened, it's that nobody there said, this is awful. Remember when Nixon called the head of the IRS and said, could you get me some IRS files? And he said, no, and he went to the press, okay. The entire IRS said, didn't object to what happened and didn't rat anybody out. Um, the corruption is deep. John was mentioning the taxpayer. How do, okay, so we got up here, what do we do now? Step one, stop the bleeding. That's what the Taxpayer Protection Pledge is about. It's a simple pledge. It's a pledge that I share with all candidates for office, governors, presidents, House, Senate, state legislators. It says, I will vote against and oppose all efforts to raise taxes, any net tax increase. Tax reform, fine. We designed it, I designed it, to help pass President Reagan's tax reform bill, which dropped rates, broadened the base, revenue neutral. Not a tax increase, revenue neutral. So it was always set up so that tax reform 2.0 could be even lower rates and a broader base, but revenue neutral. So when we first did it, we had 100 members of the House in uh, 1986, 20 in the Senate who signed the pledge, and that meant that we could look the American people in the eye and say we have the president's veto and a lot of guys in the House and Senate who are not signing off on anything that's a net tax increase. So it's safe if they go in that room and cut a deal, come back. You know it's not going to be a tax increase. Uh, moving forward in 88, all the presidential candidates took the pledge except Dole. And the guy who was supposed to win the New Hampshire primary was offered the pledge in that last debate. And Pete DuPont shared it with him. And he, he reacted kind of like vampires do if you toss a cross in their lap. And um, it didn't play well in New Hampshire. He didn't win. He lost. Bush won the primary because he took the pledge, and his major opponent didn't. Then he was 14 points behind Dukakis. And he said, read my lips, no new taxes. And he went on to win. And then he broke the pledge, unfortunately, uh, in, a, in a deal. Remember, they promised Reagan $3 of spending cuts for every dollar of tax increase. And they lied. Tax increases happened, three dollars didn't. They went to Bush and offered him two to one, which I think is just insulting. You're a cheaper date. Um, and I mean, if you're gonna cheat somebody, make it 10 to one, make him feel good. You know, if, if you're dealing with Confederate money, 100 to one, <clears throat> why not? Two to one, spending went up, not down, as a result of that. And Bush, who had a very successful presidency, managed the collapse of the Soviet Union, had a lot of blood on the floor, kicked, Iraq out of Kuwait, I mean, managed well, one hole in the bottom of the boat, and it sank. And so Republicans learned, take the pledge, win the primary, take the pledge, win the general, keep the pledge, govern well, get reelected. Because the pledge is not about taxes completely. It's as much or more about spending. Because if you say, I'm not raising taxes, you've just said, when I run into a problem, I will reform government to cost less. 
Because other people say, if I run into a problem, I've got many arrows in my quiver. I might reform government. I might just raise taxes to paper it over. Which one do you think the spending interests in Washington, D.C. are all sort of pointing at? You know, we like door two, the one with the paper it over with higher taxes, not the reform, because that might mean we don't get everything that we'd been hoping for. So the pledge on spending, people, taxes, is a commitment to reform government so that it costs less. So the pledge, we now have a majority of the sitting members of the House. Uh, we got enough people in 94 to take the pledge in the House and the Senate that there was not a single tax increase between the 93 Clinton tax hike, where there were only Democrats voting for it, and the 2009 Obama tax hike with only Democrats voting for it. In between, if you had a Republican House, Senate, or presidency, we stopped any tax increase. When the Republicans took the House back, and Republicans having signed the pledge, Republicans in 2000 and uh, 10 took the House, all tax increases went being off the table again. And that's where the big fight was. You were talking about the pledge having saved us some money. Uh, remember, Boehner, Speaker Boehner said to Obama, you want two and a half trillion in higher debt ceiling. Here's the deal. You cut spending over the next decade by two and a half trillion, or we do it together in law, no promises, in law, and, and you can have your two and a half trillion in a higher debt ceiling, and we get to take the cost curve of government bent down permanently for a 10-year period. Um, and oddly enough, Obama made the first big mistake of his presidency, and he said yes. And remember he did that sequester where he said, if you don't come up with a different idea, we'll put a cap on spending. And if you go above the cap, we'll cut across the board on all domestic discretionary spending so that it stays there. So it can't go above this. It's a real cap. And there was a super committee. And uh, Speaker Senator, uh, Senator Kerry was running the super committee. And he ran into me in the Senate. And he said, Grover, I, I need your help. Uh, I need you to talk to the Republicans. I think we're close to a deal. Well, what is it you need, Senator? Well, your wife and my wife, they should have coffee soon. Yes, they should. What do you want? Oh, we just want a $1.4 trillion tax increase. I thought you were solving a $1.2 trillion problem at this point, because we'd taken one plus off the table already and cut spending. And he said, well, the President wants $400 billion more in a stimulus package. So in the deficit reduction package, the President wanted to spend $400 billion more. 1.4 trillion higher taxes than there was 200 billion in real spending cuts that everybody had agreed to. And I was so taken aback by the, his thinking I was going to help him raise 1.4 trillion in higher taxes that I forgot to ask, tell me about the 200 billion in spending cuts that we all agree on. I'm fascinated by that. Could we do that first? Anyway, they kept wanting 1.4 trillion. That's all they wanted. And we took the sequester. We took the cap. And spending went from 24% of GDP down to 20% of GDP in two years. 24 down to 20. And we have that cap for another 10 years out. The president made a mistake and gave us a spending cap. And now, of course, a lot of reforms are being pushed that people had been put off, putting off for a long time. But the sequester worked. And we only got the sequester. We only got the budget cuts because taxes were off the table. And there were a handful of Republicans who at different times had impure thoughts um, <laughs> about tax increases. And, um, but only like it one at a time. L luckily, not enough to rush us at any given point. But they'd wander. And I, in writing the book, I found out that the Stockholm Syndrome, which is where in Stockholm in 73, some bank robbers robbed a bank and held people hostage inside the bank for a while. And it turns out that certain numbers of the people who were held hostage remained sympathetic to the, to the bank robbers even after they were freed. So it's not like, oh, I think you're swell, you know, while they're there until they're gone. No, no. Even afterwards, they were going, well, they seem to have a point. Um, turns out the FBI says that 8% of hostages have Stockholm Syndrome. Okay. So my concern is that you could get 8% of Republicans after a point um, beginning 
to think that maybe a tax increase is necessary because the other guys have a point and we should work with them. And there actually were 8% who went wobbly, just wasn't enough. Um, it, I mean, right on, right on with the FBI's uh, projected number. The last part of the book is, okay, so how do we get from 30 down towards 2? Okay? Uh, and the answer is there's not one simple answer. There's a lot of things. Step one, get towards a flat tax. Why? Because a single rate tax is difficult to raise. I'm originally from Massachusetts prior to emigrating to the United States. And <laughs> in, in Massachusetts, we have a constitutional amendment. Flat tax, single rate tax. Pennsylvania too, Illinois also. Um, and as a result, the income tax in Massachusetts, crazy liberal, Mike Dukakis, Ted Kennedy, George McGovern, Massachusetts, five and a quarter is the top marginal tax rate. And the reason is that, that when they want to raise taxes, the politicians say, I've got a really good idea, and you're all going to pay for it. Well, then we're all listening, aren't we? What's the really good idea? It better be good. It's tough to raise taxes. Remember, uh, Clinton said, I'm only going to tax the top 2%, and Obama said, I'm only going to tax the top 1%. So some of you might want to step out of the room, because this isn't going to be pleasant, but it's not you. It's someone else. Okay? The reason they like a graduate income tax isn't because it's progressive. It's so that it can divide people into groups, so they can mug us one at a time. This is the Richard Speck theory of tax increases, that if, if you can't take on everybody in the room at once, you take them out of the room one at a time. A single rate tax, ask somebody older than you who Richard Speck was. Um, if they can't divide us, it's much tougher. So getting to a single rate tax is particularly important. The other factor is to remember that the best way to raise revenue is growth. That's what Reagan taught us, showed us anyway. Um, and that is, in a 10-year period right now, if the economy grew not at uh, Obama levels, also known as French levels, 2% growth, okay, but at 4% growth over a decade, if you grew at Reagan's levels instead of Obama's levels for 10 years in a row, the federal government um, would have $5.6 trillion, trillion dollars more in revenue not a tax increase. Okay? You can cut taxes a lot and still be net positive if your tax cuts give you 4% growth instead of 2% growth. Reagan did that. That's what supply-side economics is about. You want money? Grow the economy. More jobs, more opportunity, more wealth, and the government gets its share. Okay? Now, I think you should use it to cut spending and cut taxes more, but um, it's, it's available there. Let me close by talking about how we get to the future. And then we can talk about some of the specifics on how to cut spending, how to cut taxes. Because there are lots of good ideas, and they're all good ideas. And the ones we can get are good ideas. Which antelope do you eat? The slowest one. Okay? You know, which taxes do you cut? The ones in front of you, the ones that are available. Which spending do you get? The ones you can. Keep working at it. There's not some right order in which to do it other than that which you can. Spending that ought not to be there, make a list of those and go after the easy ones rather than the harder ones. Um, there are two coalitions in American politics. There's the Leave Us Alone Coalition, Reagan Republicans, the people who sit around a table and everybody around the table wants one thing. They want on this issue that matters to them and that they vote on, they wish to be left alone. Leave my kids alone, my faith alone, my property alone, my profession alone, my business alone, my Second Amendment alone, my education of my kids, I want to homeschool, leave my taxes down. Everybody around the table has a different reason for being around the table. The guy who wants to make money all day looks across the table at the guy who wants to go to church all day and says, that's not how I spend my time. And they both look over at the guy who wants to fondle his guns all day and say, that's not how we spend our time. But it's not important or necessary that we all agree what we do with our freedom. It's just we want to be free. And he can be free to do weird stuff, and he can be free to do odd stuff, and I'm free to do really important stuff that I like, and we're all happy. Okay? This is a low-maintenance coalition. This is not like the other team. right? The other team sits around a table, Hillary's table. Obama stole it for a while. She's getting it back. Um, <laughs> trial lawyers, labor unions, 
the big city political machines, the two wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare dependency, people who make $90,000 a year managing the dependency of other people, making sure they don't get jobs and become Republicans. Um, all of the coercive utopians, the nanny state people, the people who design lights that convince you you have glaucoma, the, the people who design those toilets are too small to flush completely, the, the guys who mandate cars that are too small to put your entire family into, and on the Sabbath you have to separate the green glass from the white glass, from the clear glass for the recycling priests, and they have a whole list of things that you have to do and that you can't do that is slightly longer and more tedious than Leviticus. Um, <laughs> so around the left's table, they can be friends as long as we're stupid enough to keep throwing money in the center of the table. Then they're like, they're happy, like that scene after the bank robbery in the movie. One for you, one for you, they're all very happy. It's okay. But if we do our job and say no new taxes and mean it and hold it and reform government so it's smaller and they see that pile of cash of them dwindling, then our friends on the left begin to look at each other a little bit more like the second to the last scene in those lifeboat movies. Now they're trying to decide who to eat or who to throw overboard because the left is not made up of friends and allies. It is made up of competing parasites. And if we don't let them eat taxpayers, they'll just as cheerfully gnaw on the guy sitting next to them. So as we move forward, our job is how do we grow the number of people who care about freedom, who vote on the freedom agenda. And my argument is you figure out what they are and you expand them, right? 30 years ago, in all 57 states, homeschooling was illegal. <laughs> it was truancy. They put you in jail for homeschooling. Today there are two million kids being homeschooled, ten million children have been homeschooled in the last several years, and, they know, and people who homeschool know one thing. If, if one team came to power, they would take this away from me. Okay? Thirty years ago, there were no concealed carry permits to speak of in this country, certainly not shall issue. Today, 41 states have shall issue concealed carry. 11.1 .1 million Americans have a concealed carry permit. 11 million. That's one out of 20. That's five percent of the adult population. They know one thing. If one team got into power, they would take that freedom away from you. People vote on lifestyle issues and they don't like being messed with. The newest addition, and again, our job is to find groups like that and make them bigger. All of the effort to expand school choice is we creates more people who have something in their children's the choice of their children's education that is so precious to them that they will never let it go. Until they have it, they didn't know they had it. But once they have it, they're not letting you take it away. Watch for vaping. This is those e-cigarettes, okay? Six million Americans vape. It's healthier for you than cigarettes. They feel good about themselves. They like it. They spend more time vaping than monks spend praying in a given day. It is a lifestyle issue. It is a big part of their life. And one party wants to tax it and or ban it completely. I like the vapors. They show up at state legislatures and complain when people want to tax them. They're much more helpful than the smokers were during these fights. And this, the left has created an entire group that actually cares deeply about an issue that if you don't vape, you might go, that's an odd thing to vote on. It's not if it's you. It's not if it's your interest. And the left is creating more of those as we move forward. So uh, with that, I'd like to take questions. And you want to tell me and us how to do this. Well, thank you, Grover. Uh, he's, Grover's been kind enough to set aside a few minutes to uh, take questions from the audience. My only hope is that if you've got a question, just raise your hand. We have some staff here who will get a microphone in your direction. And if just get the mic in your hand before you start asking. I think we've got and there's one, one over here. And then after that, we'll go over here. Uh, first here, here, and then there. Hi. If we are successful in getting taxes reduced, what would be the criteria and who would make the decision of what expenditures and what we're spending money on then would be cut? Well, I think there are two things. We're unlikely to cut 
dramatically spending. Because cutting means taking, we're doing 10, we're not going to do 9. Okay? I'm much more interested in reforming government so it costs less. When we did tax reform, uh, welfare reform, passed it three times, and Clinton signed it the third time and acts like it was his idea. It was actually President Reagan's idea back in 1971. It just took a while to get through the process. Uh, what we did was we block granted it to the states. And then the states decided to become more, to, the 50 states competed with each other. I mean, the reason why 50 states doing something are better than one federal government. It's not because the states are closer to us. I don't know about you guys. I'm not any closer to the governor than I am to the, to the president, you know, the, you know, closeness to the government. It's that there are 50 of them. And if they do something stupid, it's easy to tell, okay? Only stupid ideas can be done at the national level. You know, <laughs> stupid ideas cannot grow organically from the states because if Vermont does something truly stupid, people simply leave. They send their, first they send their kids out, and then they send their money out, and then eventually they leave. Okay, so you can't do, that's why, that's why they always want a national minimum wage increase. If you think it's such a good idea, Vermont, why don't you vote a $50,000 minimum wage in Vermont? Ha, huh? you all get rich, right? Oh, you know it's not going to work. Really? Okay. Um, so they're always trying to take the dumb ideas nationally. But if you move some stuff out to the states and allow them to compete on how to do Medicaid or food stamps or other projects, that will give you savings rather than cut it 10%. So I'm, I'm all in favor of reforming government to cost less. Paul Ryan's budget is the future. Paul Ryan's budget block grants most means-tested welfare programs. There are 185 means-tested welfare programs. 185, not one welfare, 185. Block grant them to the states and take things like Medicare and so on, add in comp competition, and use that to bend the cost curve down. Not cut it, but reform it. His bill, which has passed the House four times, four times, and uh, only needs 51 votes in the Senate because it would, can pass, because it's a budget cut, can pass with rec within reconciliation. We just need a president. If you pass that bill, we're at 20 percent of GDP. Without Ryan, we go up to 40 percent as people get older and all of these welfare things kick in. We pass the bill, 40 years from now we're at 16 percent, okay? And that's without any assumptions about growth. So we'd actually be much better off. But that, all you do is reform government to cost less. You know that little deal they did on Medicare, the doc fix? Okay? And they gave the Democrats a few dollars now, and some of the guys on our team are going, hey, the Democrats are getting a few dollars now. It is a net cut in today's present value, $3 trillion going out. $3 trillion. Why? Because it bends the cost curve down out for the next 75 years. And it's a change in the law. It's not like you have to trust some appropriator 30 years from now to do the right thing. That's the law, and it goes out there. $3 trillion is not nothing for a little fix. And by the way, that was an entitlement reform without a tax increase. What the Democrats have always said is, we'd love to do entitlement reform. They just want to have a tax increase in the middle of it. You can have your pizza. We just get to put shards of glass on it. Um, <laughs> hey, you said you like pizza. What, what's the matter now? Um, so. I think we, refor we dramatically reform government rather than worry about cutting this out or the other thing. Um, because the one just gets you into an argument of we're going to have nine instead of ten. Well, that's not good. But what if you gave everyone school choice and gave the, the money to follow the kid instead of continuing to send more and more money and, le and let schools compete? That gets you lower costs without taking anything away from people because you gave them freedom. Thanks, Guru. Uh, right over here, there's a microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the fairness issue and how it has become so perverted. I'd like your take on that. Sure. Um, we should always recognize that we need to understand people's sense of fairness, but we shouldn't think that the New York Times gets to def define that. I think one of the healthiest signs about the United States is that polling data for the last 40 years has said that 70% of the American people want to abolish the death tax. Now the death tax is paid by 2, 3% and it's going to be less in the future because we got it dramatically scaled back um, thanks to uh, the Bush tax cuts which were made permanent, many of them. 70% um, of the American people 
think it's wrong to heavily tax 1% of the American people. Okay? That's not what they tell you when you read the New York Times editorials. That everybody, there's this bloodlust to tax the 1%. Um, when we accurately say it's a death tax on your life savings, that's what it is. It's your life savings that they want to then come and take a chunk of. Um, it's, I think that we find in Massachusetts, again, in Massachusetts, five times people in Massachusetts were asked to vote, they'd either do an initiative or get the legislature put on the ballot, to go to a progressive income tax from the flat tax. Five times Massachusetts voted it down. They said no. Right? When I was in school, they said everyone agrees that graduate income tax is fair because Karl Marx said so. You know, um, <laughs> Massachusetts doesn't think it's fair. They think everyone pays the same 5% is fair. And they have this very sophisticated conversation. If we all pay 5%, the Kennedy kids will be on my team when we say no to a tax increase. But if they separate us, the Kennedy kids, they'll raise taxes on them, and then they'll come for me, and the Kennedy kids won't help us. They'll divide us into groups. So I think we have much more going for us on fairness with a flat tax. And the Constitution, from the very beginning, and including now, had one of the restrictions on taxes Congress can levy is that they have to be uniform. And the income tax that was in for about one year in 1894 was struck down by the Supreme Court because it was a graduate income tax. They said, that's not uniform, gone. And it was thrown out. Now, the Second Amendment was kind of ignored for you know, decades by the court until it became powerful enough as an issue through the people that all of a sudden the Supreme Court said, oh, look, it's Second Amendment. People have the right to, to keep and bear arms. I believe the day will come when a court rules that uniform means uniform and that anything other than a flat, single-rate tax is not constitutional. It is what they meant. Um, yes, Michael. If I ask you a question, on the flat tax, which I agree with you on, and you talk about division where the, the, the left tries to divide the Republicans, but in many cases we divide ourselves. Because you have like Mike Huckabee who's going to announce he's going to run for president, who is a fair taxer. And what I find is that the fair tax people won't talk to the flat tax people, and the flat tax people won't talk to the fair tax people, but we're going to need everybody if indeed we're going to get one or the other. Yeah. How, do you, how do you bring them all together for one moment in time? Because at this point, you're not going to get them together. Yeah. Free beer. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been in, yeah, I've, no, I've been, in, I've been involved in several um, uh, medium-ranged treaty meetings where we try and get everybody to stop kicking each other under the table. Um, and I think we're getting there again, frankly, uh, in terms of the leadership. Look, to get to a fair tax, the, f the single rate um, sales tax, retail sales tax. First, you have to have, have a single rate. Okay? So getting to a flat tax is on the way to a fair tax. It's not a competitor you, you know, um, to get done. Two, we have to get rid of the 16th Amendment in order to have a fair tax, because we're not going to have, the, the danger is um, we have a fair tax, a, a retail sales tax, which would collapse into a VAT pretty quickly with the left any time in charge. And, and an income tax. And then we're Europe. Then we're France. And nobody shaves under their arms anymore. It's going to be awful. Um, <laughs> the, we don't want to end up like Europe with a VAT or a retail sales tax and an income tax. One or the other we can live with as long as we have to. Um, wink, quick. But um, we want to make sure that we get to a single rate tax. It, there's a challenge on the retail sales tax. And that is, uh, and I, I'm not quite sure how we get around, deal with this. If you're 21, you don't care if you have this, a tax that raises the same amount of money, sales tax, flat tax. One, they watch you earn it, they steal some. The other, they w and otherwise go away. The other is they leave you alone until they catch you buying something, they steal some, and leave you alone. Okay? Pretty much the same. And the base is the same, consumed income. Okay? Um, but if you're 65 and you've been paying income taxes all your life, and they go, you know what, we got a deal for you. We just got rid of the income tax. Yeah, I know, but I'm retired now. I'm not going to pay the income tax. 
We're not going to take 20% or a third or you know, X percent of all your life savings as you consume. So it's a, there's, there's a transition problem, particularly for retired people. And we just have to work that through. I think we have one back here, and then we'll go. Your uh, pledge. Yeah. Do you have any idea of the contenders for the Republican nomination? How many will sign your pledge? How many haven't? How many won't? You, would you talk about that? Sure. Um, here's the good news. Almost everybody who is, I used to feel more confident, but now they keep, more people keep showing up. But all the people I know are running or thinking of running, including Huckabee, have signed it either as governor as senator, and kept it, governor, senator, or previous election uh, presidential candidate Huckabee, with the exception of Jeb Bush. Um, Jeb Bush uh, did not sign it. He didn't raise taxes, but he didn't sign it. And um, he says he doesn't want to sign it. Both his brother signed it and kept it. His dad signed it and didn't keep it. If my father had thrown away a perfectly good presidency, I would do him the honor of learning what happened and then avoid that. Um, look, nobody's life is a complete waste. Some people serve as bad examples. And um, <laughs> so, children, don't do that, OK? Um, so it's my, it's my assumption that at the end of the day, Bush will make a statement to make it clear that he won't raise taxes. On the other hand, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep because the majority of the US House of Representatives, including all the virtually every Republican, has signed the pledge never to raise taxes. And we're, we're just about a majority of all the members in the Senate, including almost all the Republicans, who've taken that pledge. Nobody's going to offer you a tax increase. Um, that said, I feel more comfortable. You know, these people go, oh, you don't need a pledge. I, you know I won't raise taxes. I don't have to put it in writing. What if your neighbor said, I'm not going to eat your dog, but I wouldn't put it in writing. <laughs> I keep the dog inside. <laughs> what do you mean? No, I don't, I don't want to put it in writing, really. You know I won't do that. Then why wouldn't you put it in writing? Um, we really do have a Republican Party commi oh, uh, committed to, and, and Bobby Jindal, they're pushing so hard to try and get him to raise taxes because energy prices went down and the energy oil taxes are down, and so they've got a lot of spending cuts to make. And he says, I'm not raising taxes. And they yell, oh, you're letting Grover Norquist run the state. And I mean, just between us, don't tell anybody else, but between us, the pledge isn't to me. The pledge is to the American people. And the power of the pledge, I had 60 minutes, do a nice profile. Um, because when 60 Minutes says, we'd like to do a profile on you. Your first thought isn't, thought isn't that's sweet. Um, <laughs> I call my wife, did we file our income taxes like all the time? <laughs> are, we, are we sure? Um, but we did, they said we're going to do two hour and a half interviews, 60 Minutes. This is the one where they're trying to get, 60 Minutes is three 12 minute segments. So it's actually 36 minutes plus ads. So you get a 12-minute segment on you. You know, some of it's you running around, some of it's other people chatting about you, and the others when they're looking at your pores and asking you questions, right? And so I got two three-hour segments. They told me nobody other than Christopher Hitchens had ever been interviewed for that long. And Chris, they were just having fun, because Chris is fun to talk to. Um, but with me, they kept saying, so you know, Reed, Harry Reid says you're the most powerful guy in DC. Are you? Because I was supposed to say, yes, I am. And then they'd make Lou look like an idiot. And what I had to say a hundred times, because it finally got on the TV screen, because I didn't give them anything else, was the tax issue is the most powerful issue in American history. The pledge is to the American people. All the pledge does is make it clear that somebody made the commitment. Because if it's not written down in the pledge, and somebody says, you know, the last thing I want to do is raise taxes. Now is not the time to raise taxes. That person did not promise not to raise your taxes. He just told you how pained he would be when he raises your taxes. Um, or the timing, as in, not now. Two years ago, I said, now is not the time to raise taxes. But that was two years ago. Um, so the pledge is without context. I won't raise taxes, period. Um, and it's to the American people. So it's a very powerful tool to empower the American people to believe you when you make that commitment. And that's, that's why it's been helpful, and that's why it's so good that so many Republicans have, have made that a central part of their, their governing. And, it, and it's saved a lot of tax increases that might otherwise have gone through at the state and, and national level. 
we got time for two more questions. We'll go right over here. Uh, in the U.S., we pay health insurance. In Europe, they don't. It's part of their taxes. And when I see calculations comparing our income taxes to Europe, I never see that thrown in. Have you run numbers to find out how we really compare to Europe as far as our tax rate when you include the fact that they're getting free health care and we have to pay for ours as a separate payment? Um, you could do those numbers. I guess my thought is if it's voluntary and outside the government, um, the way they save money on health care is they ration. Um, and so they just spend less. They ration. At certain ages, you don't get certain things. Uh, you wait, you know, if you wait long enough for certain operations, the government doesn't have to do them because you're not there anymore. Um, and so it, it's a completely different structure. I mean, we also have a national defense and they don't, you know. So um, we each do different things with the resources we, we do tax. I think we'd be much better off moving that part of our federal spending that is health care more into the private sector, health savings accounts. Yeah. The answer is I don't know the numbers. The real question is if you throw that number in, mm -hmm. you know, even if they're enforced because it's, it's public rather than private, we just make private No, they, they're still worse off. I mean, France is 50% of GDP um, spent by the government. I mean, it, it's Sweden is, these are ridiculously high percentages of government uh, that, that the Europeans have. Now, th look, the left school, when I was in college, my friends on the left wanted to turn us into some cross between um, East Germany and Sweden, okay? Um, now they've moved a little bit our way and they just want to turn us into France. Um, now, I don't want to be France, okay? We, you know, I don't, I don't want to be England, I don't want to be Europe, okay? We left, we're not there anymore, we're gone. We had a whole war to keep the British out of our hair. Um, and, but it is helpful that the left has moved from East Germany to France as the model. So they've made a rather significant concession. I still don't want to go where they want to go. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's nice to go visit, but you don't want to live there. I think we have one right over here. Yeah, right in the middle. And that'll, sorry, it'll have to be our last question. If you could wake up tomorrow and, and, and wish for the uh, legislation that had passed, which legislation would you wish would pass tomorrow? The Ryan budget plan along with the uh, tax reform that Ryan and Hatch are putting together, or I could live with the Rubio tax reform, or the Cruz tax reform, or Rand Paul's tax reform. Um, they're all moving in the same direction. The good news is they all have to have different tax reforms, right? But they all look an awful lot. Dramatically lower rates, you know, uh, dramatically more tax-free savings available, territorial tax system. But the Ryan budget plan to reform entitlements and one of the Republican tax reform packages and I love all my children and they're all beautiful. Um, before we give uh, Grover another round of applause, I wanted to just give you a few housekeeping items. For those of you who'd like to stay and uh, purchase or get a copy of Grover's book, you can do it right here in the back of the room, and then we're going to be setting a table up in the middle of the room for you to stand in line and go through the line to meet Grover and say hi and get a, a signed book. So I'll tell you where the naughty books, parts of the book are. Yeah, exactly. You'll get some hints. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, please stick around if you can. Grover, thank you so much. Thank you.